Hi, welcome to Constitutional Chats, hosted by me, Janine Turner, and Kathy Gillespie, with students, Dakari Chapman, and me, Tova Kaplan. Join us as we discuss hot topic issues with constitutional experts. It's sponsored by Constituting America. Well, all right. Welcome to Constitutional Chess. I'm going to tell you about everybody that's on tonight. Um, I'm Janine Turner. As you know, I'm an actress. You can go to JanineTurner.com and find out more about what I'm doing these days um, and things of that nature. But I'm also the founder and co-president of Constitute America. So we're thrilled that you're with us tonight. Kathy Gillespie is our co-president. And Kathy Gillespie is one of the also, as well as being a chief of staff for many years on the Hill. She's also one of the 16 private citizens serving on the U.S. Semi-Quincentennial Commission. One of the 16, very prestigious. And the, 20, the Semi-Quincentennial Commission is helping organize the celebration of our country's 250th birthday. So that is going to be awesome. And so Kathy, say hello. Hi, everybody. We're glad that you're here. And Tova Love Kaplan. Tova Love Kaplan is 16 years old. You're not going to believe that when we're finished. She is so brilliant. And she lives in Chicago, Illinois. She currently serves as our National Youth Director for Constituting America. And she runs the National Youth Advisory Board like a CEO. CEOs have nothing on Tova. She is a three-time winner of our Constituting America's We the Future contest, which you should check that out. It's a great thing to be doing this summer. She won in three categories, left brain, right brain. She won for entrepreneurial category, where she made a marketing plan for us in, in middle school. Then she won for PSA, public service announcement. And then she won this year for STEM, where she created an app, which we hope to have up in the fall, early fall, or maybe sooner. She is very passionate about educating and empowering young people to use their constitutional rights and just quite, quite, quite an extraordinary young woman. Say hello, Tova. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm super excited about today's topic. <laughs> we are too. Okay, next, the oh so wonderful Dakari Chapman. Dakari Chapman is our Constituting America student ambassador. He is also 16 years old, and you're not going to believe it when the show's over that he's 16. He's so fabulous and wonderful and brilliant. He is currently a junior and a full-time college student, um, a junior in high school and a full-time college student in South Carolina. He has won Constituting America's We the Future contest twice, once for Best PSA, where he reminded viewers the Constitution is an American thing, so know it, and another for a short film. Man on the Street, which is, all these clips are at constitutingamerica.org. It's really quite wonderful. Um, and, but guess what, folks? He is a working actor, seen most recently on HBO's The Righteous Gemstones and in Netflix's Outer Banks. Dakari wishes to be an actor, but also a politician, but he knows you really have to be an actor to be a politician. Those are his words. Say hello, Dakari. Hello, everyone. I hope you all are well, and I'm very excited to hear all about space tonight. There we go. Now, our special guest. Are you ready? Mr. Mike Gold. Mr. Mike Gold is currently serving as the Acting Associate Administrator for NASA's Office of International and Interagency Relations. He is also responsible for providing strategic direction to the Office of General Counsel and supporting NASA's LEO commercialization efforts. And I asked what LEO means, and LEO, capital L-E-O, means low earth orbit. Doesn't that sound fascinating? Prior to joining NASA, Mr. Gold was the Vice President of Civil Space at Maxar Technologies and was also General Counsel for the company's Radiant Solutions Business Unit. Mr. Gold was the Bigelow Aeros was the Bigelow Aeros was with Bigelow Aerospace, where he established um, the company's Washington office, plus oversaw the launches of its Genesis One and Two spacecraft. Mr. Gold received a team award from NASA 
for his contributions to the Bigelow Expandable Activity Module. Welcome, Mr. Mike Gold. Thank you, Janine. It's such a pleasure to be here. And we hope you appreciated NASA delaying the launch to fit perfectly with your Saturday event. We didn't want it to be old, so we're trying to accommodate <laughs> schedules here. Thank you so much for doing that just for us, Mr. Gold. Yes, we appreciate it greatly. It was so exciting. Um, so excited. I'm so glad everybody's okay, too. Okay, and our, we have two special guests tonight. And our second special guest is Professor Sean O'Keefe. Currently, Mr. Sean, Professor Sean O'Keefe, is a professor at Syracuse University Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. We like that word, citizenship. On four separate occasions, Professor O'Keefe served as a presidential appointee. He has served as administrator of NASA, deputy director of the Office of Management and Budget, Budget and deputy assistant to the president, all under President George W. Bush and Secretary of the Navy and Comptroller and CE CFO uh, at the Defense Department under President George H.W. Bush. In recognition of his public service, Professor O'Keefe is the recipient of many awards and honors, including the Defense Department's Distinguished Public Service Award, the faculty recipient of the Syracuse University Chancellor's Award for Public Service, and the U.S. Navy Public Service Award. Welcome, Professor Sean O'Keefe. Thank you very much, Janine. Nice to be with you all. This is really wonderful. And again, I also commend uh, our good friends at NASA for uh, making today a really special event to coincide with exactly what we're talking about this evening. You couldn't have planned it better. And last Wednesday, uh, I think uh, Kathy Gillespie worked herself uh, very hard to make sure it got delayed at least one day, <laughs> a few days to make this work just right. So it's a pleasure to be with you all. Thank you. We we were thrilled today. I mentioned earlier because we were talking about pilots, and I know that uh, um, Mr. O'Keefe, you you've worked with the U.S. Navy as Secretary of the Navy and Comptroller. Um, and my dad was a West Pointer, and he was in West Point, 1957, class of 57. So he was one of the first. It was Air Force Army back then in 57, as you know. So he was one of the first to fly the B-58 Hustler, and I bet y'all know what that is. <laughs> Indeed, no doubt about it. That's a, a classic old uh, uh, bomber aircraft that was uh, really quite a, an extraordinary workhorse, no doubt about that. Yeah, and it was very dangerous. He told me, but he was one of the first to fly twice the speed of sound, so he's in the Mach 2, Mach 2 club. Um, so we're very proud of, is it Doug and, Doug and Mike? Doug and uh, Bob. The two astronauts? Doug and Bob! You know what I thought was interesting, and, and we, I, we can start with this, is, you know, before, that's new to say Doug and Bob, isn't it? I thought that was really different. Usually it's, you know, the, the first and last names, and, and they're just going Doug and Bob, Doug and Bob. So I thought, I wonder what's behind that. I wonder if they're trying just to make Doug and Bob, you know, uh, is it Doug and Bob? It is Doug and Bob, right? <laughs> to, to make them, uh, I don't know, one of us? Can, do y'all know anything about why they did Doug and Bob? They kept saying Doug and Bob. So, I mean, I think that they spent so much time with both the NASA and the SpaceX team that had bred a lot of familiarity, that everyone would just sit there having breakfast with them. They were a member of the team, and that's why they call them Doug and Bob. But between us, I just call them heroes because I think that's what they are, the bravery and courage that they showed and going up and all of our astronauts and everyone in the NASA family. So we're just trying to blaze a trail for Dakari Tova for you to – Come next. Uh, we're doing this all for the next generation. So really appreciate what those uh, people did. And again, I just I just say heroes. I agree with that. I was holding my daughter's hand, just just hoping, just hoping, just hoping everything was going to be okay. And I was telling her how brave, how extraordinarily brave they were to go do that. And I remember sitting there watching the you know our astronauts land on the walk on the moon. I I was maybe six. And uh, I was there with my father, and it was just this monumental um, a moment. And it's my daughter, who's 22 for some reason. It's her first, actually the first time she ever watched the launch. So, um, Mr. Mr. Uh, um, O'Keefe, do you want to add to that before I turn a question over? Because I do have questions. But uh, to today's launch, it was successful. It happened. No, I'd, I'd say uh, it, it's not terribly unusual that they are very – approachable people, all the members of the astronaut corps I ever knew and have worked with and still stay in touch with. 
and uh, they are very anxious to always be involved in communities and talking about their missions and so forth afterwards. And some of the most enjoyable events I've ever been to were right after a, a, a mission return from, from space. Uh, the crew would get together and they'd go into all kinds of different locations around the country just to talk about what they did on that particular mission. And it was absolutely fascinating because you'd, you'd get the most unbelievable questions, <laughs> but it also really got to know something about each of those individuals. And they were very open about themselves. So they're remarkable people. They, uh, and I think they're, you gotta be a special kind of person to, to be in the astronaut corps, but they are very, very approachable folks and uh, incredibly, um, uh, humble in many respects, which is really an irony, you know, given the fact they've all achieved so much, you'd think they would be very self-assured people who are very standoffish, but not at all. They are extremely humble. And that was explained to me one time by one astronaut who said, that's an easy one. The very first time you fly and you're up in space and you look down on the earth and you, think, you, look, you see the unbelievable beauty and expanse of that. Uh, you realize, I don't know what it is I'm so proud of by comparison to this miracle, what this remarkable achievement is. And they all have that sense of, of just, you know, their station and where they are, even though they are really exemplary folks who uh, perform exceptionally well. And I'm sure Doug and Bob are no different. <laughs> Doug and Bob, Doug and Bob are out there right now. And, you know, um, as, a, as a first sort of, of, of question here, I um, I think one of the things we want to we want to to, to to sharpen our focus tonight is on the fact that this was now. And by the way, my daughter just graduated from Rice University, so I'm sure you know Rice University graduates. Many, <laughs> uh oh, many of them. No hush, hush. Many of them. Oh gosh, become at you know the behind the scenes. Well, I'm gonna have to toss this because my dog's barking. But I, the question I want to ask is, it it takes a whole group. Oh gosh, I'm tossing it. I'm tossing it to Tova. But before you do, let me say I work for a Rice University graduate, so go Rice. He signs my checks, so. <laughs> okay, so um, first of all, thank you for coming here. Um, I know you were mentioning um, part of your work is inspiring the younger generation, and I can say as a member of said generation, I was definitely inspired watching um, the amazing things that Americans were able to achieve today. Um, so thank you for providing that. Um, I was I was thinking that I was wondering that um, you know one of the main purposes, in fact, the main purpose of NASA is to conduct scientific exploration to kind of expand the horizons of our scientific knowledge. But I was wondering um, when you see a lot of like private companies now beginning to launch things into space and really heavily invest in space exploration. Is there a difference in the goals of these companies? Are they as scientific? Are they more commercial or like, how are the goals of space exploration for private companies different than that of NASA or publicly funded companies? So uh, Tova, you know, I think diversity is important. Uh, that's true in, in people as well as in approaches and companies. And I have seen such incredible innovation and, and complementary synergy between the private sector and what NASA is trying to accomplish that I think either of us alone would not be able to do what we're doing together. And today is the perfect example of that, that the private sector brings a degree of innovation, of cost efficiency, that you may not always get, you know, frankly, in government. But you combine that with the goals of government, as you say, which is the betterment of all of us, scientific exploration, inspiring that awe. And when you put those two things together, that's when I think we really all win. You know, I'd also add that uh, I'm from Montana. And, you know, if not for exploration, my state wouldn't exist. And there you saw that the government through the journey of discovery with Lewis and Clark, you know, really established the blaze the trail for everyone else to come, or at least many others to come. Um, and, but it took the bankers, the entrepreneurs, the homesteaders, the private sector to then build up, 
you know, what, you know, we now have at home. So it, it's really both, both have their strengths uh, and weaknesses and together uh, we can do better to achieve those goals. And again, we saw it on display and in the skies and now in the heavens with SpaceX. May I just interject and ask that when they, when it, after blast off, and I don't know if it was uh, you know, phase one or phase two, um, they kept saying nominal. My dad used to always come and I say, dad, come home and I would say, dad, how was your trip? It was not a bit all I think nominal is really, nominal obviously means everything is okay. But there, wasn't there a piece that was supposed to come back down today that, so that it's reusable? Yes. Um, uh, Professor uh, okay, if you want to talk about that one? Yep, it's, it, it, it did, and it did return, and it landed on a platform uh, out right off the Atlantic you know, coast. Um, the, uh, this is a, a very similar concept to what we used to see on the space shuttle program, for example. Two solid rocket boosters on the sides of the shuttle, and you have a big orange tank in the middle and the whole thing. The first part that, that departs is the two solid rocket boosters, and they would you know, peel off after about two minutes, three minutes of flight, drop into the ocean, were retrieved, refurbished, and used again. What SpaceX figured out how to do is to do the same principle of dropping off the original first stage and having it land back on a platform so you don't have to dredge it out, you don't need to refurbish it, and you get to use it again much more promptly. That's the kind of efficiency Mike was talking about that companies can do because they have learned how to do that over a repetitious time as opposed to doing things for the first time. When those two rocket boot, solid rocket boosters were on the, the shuttle program, that was the first time they'd ever been used. And that's typically the way NASA has done things is if somebody's done it before, why are they doing it? <laughs> you want to go out there and look at doing things that no one else has done. And so you're really doing things from scratch. And in the course of that, that's, that's never going to be efficient. It's always going to be, you know, born of discovery to Toba's point of exactly what's the difference between the two. That's where the line of demarcation really exists is the ability of a, uh, of a space agency, a government agency like NASA to develop things, to create things, to start things, to prototype stuff. And then in turn, business community knows how to replicate that with greater precision, lower cost, more innovation, everything else that goes with that. And that's what we're seeing on display starting today. I mean, if I can just and add to that, you know, anyone, oh, okay. who, who owns a car, right? So let me ask you a question. When you run out of gas on the car, do you throw it away? And if we did, what would that cost in terms of cars? And that's what we've literally done in the space program for a very long time. And to your question, Tova, you know, it, we, NASA, you know, no government agency told SpaceX to do that, by the way, in terms of reusability. They decided to do that on their own and became, you know, more innovative and now we benefit from it. So I think that reusability aspect, which is something we take for granted in our daily lives, was something that the private sector brought, which will now benefit the scientific exploration of the agency. And what about, I'm going to toss this to Dakari now, what about the, we were talking about the, the innovation of, of the private, um, of the pri of private enterprise, enterprise, there's also competition, um, you know, they're going to be competing, who, who can, can give the best plan to NASA for the best price, um, well, because I hear now there's another company called, um, I guess, you know, SpaceX's Tesla's, but there's another company, Blue Horizon, I heard about today. So won't the, uh, that, that kind of private enterprise competition, won't that help also with bringing, keeping prices down and the, comp, you know, the whole fire of competition? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's no question about it. That, that's part of what is going to motivate all these companies to participate. It's Blue Origin, uh, which is uh, Jeff Bezos' company. You have uh, Elon Musk's you know, SpaceX. Uh, uh, Richard Branscombe with uh, Virgin Galactic. You've got, you know, the orbital uh, space uh, outfit that is part of Northrop Grumman now. I mean, all of these are going to be very competitive opportunities. And then you still got some folks who've been legacy kind of space industry folks, like the uh, the Boeing's and the Lockheed Martins who are going to be out there, and they want to participate too. So that motivates them 
to become more efficient, more competitive, lower their their cost of doing things, as well as to improve the performance, because that's the real uh, development of what's involved there. So rather than having a, just a very finite number of players, now the horizons expanded more dramatically, and you've got a lot of creativity, a lot of innovation, and a lot of competitiveness that comes from that. And I think it's an example of NASA being a smart customer. Uh, that's, you know, something that's important for the government to do. And if you look at the commercial crew program, SpaceX was hired, but so was Boeing, you know, as Sean mentions that we've still got some of the traditional, you know, companies that have been building spacecraft on a longstanding basis. So we'll actually have two companies uh, that are now supporting us. Redundancy is very important in space as well as competition because you never know when you're going to need to get up there. So it's great to have backups and some duplicative capability for safety. And yeah, so it's not Blue Horizon, it's Blue Origin. Okay, now I know. <laughs> I know I heard blue something today. Okay, um, Dakari, your turn. Yes, thank you both for being, for being here. This is very fascinating. Um, as I was looking in, uh, kind of doing a little bit of research uh, before the show, I was noticing some talk of a space force uh, that wanted to be created. I think this article dated back to like 2018 and there was a little bit of talk about that. Um, and I had like a three, a three question sequence in a way. How do you guys feel about this said Space Force? And the other two questions are, does the constitution permit this? And if not, uh, can, Congress, can Congress make these type of decisions? So, sure. Um, you know, we actually work already uh, with Space Force and, and Janine, I forget whether this is before we went live or after, but we talked about Army, that Air Force came out of the Army. And it was so interesting to watch that the same arguments that Army was using to prevent the creation of the Air Force were some of the same arguments that Air Force made to prevent the creation of the Space Force. You could literally cut and paste those words. Um, to carry relative to the constitutionality of Space Force uh, in the need, you know, part of the Constitution is to provide for the general defense and to make sure our citizens and our property are safe and secure. And with so much of our assets and really our entire modern society tied up in space, it's very important that we be able to protect ourselves, uh, and I believe is not only in keeping with the Constitution, but is required uh, by the Constitution. And part of the reason Space Force, I think, is so important, and this is why we form the Air Force, that when you have pilots in charge of something, what are they going to choose and invest in and do research on? Probably more planes. Um, when you have people in space, though, who grew up in the space world, aerospace, they're going to be more likely to invest in the technologies that we need. Uh, now, to be clear, you know, we don't want to militarize space per se, that our goal is a peaceful and prosperous environment in space. And that's clearly what NASA does. We are a completely uh, civil organization. But even with Space Force, you know, that is the idea and that they'll be working to gain information, intelligence and protect our satellites uh, in order to allow uh, not only the military, but all of a society to function because we are completely dependent uh, upon space today. Uh, again, NASA does cooperate with them on what's called planetary defense. So uh, if you've seen Armageddon or Deep Impact or any of the asteroid movies, you know, that's, there's truth to it that, you know, we're due uh, for an asteroid hit. Apothis, uh, which is a giant asteroid in 2029, will come so close to Earth, it will go underneath our geostationary satellites. And we work with what was once uh, Air Force, now Space Force, to monitor uh, those asteroids. And hopefully we never reach this point, but if there needs to be mitigation, you know, that will be NASA working together with SpaceX. So there's some great crossover. Uh, and I think that it's in keeping with the best practices of the Constitution. Love that. That's also fascinating. Um, yeah, I do want to ask about these treaties. And I bet Kathy does too. So Kathy, ask away. Oh, we can't hear you, Kathy. You're muted. Yeah, you're muted. There you go. There you go. 
We would love to hear a little bit more about the whole Artemis uh, project and agreements. I think President Trump mentioned that today in his comments. And Mike, I, I think you've worked directly on that. And I'm sure uh, Professor O'Keefe, you've been involved in it too. Um, could y'all tell us a little bit about that? Sure, so today was about Launch America, but it was also about launching the entire world. That one of the things I love about space is that it forces us to go beyond who we are as people and national borders. The challenge is so intense, so costly, so unknown, that we have to come together not only as Americans, but as humans to be able to tackle this. The very physical manifestation of that is the International Space Station, which has been continuously crewed, you know, Takari Tova for your entire lives. Um, 20 years now, we're about to celebrate the 20th anniversary. And to see people from around the world, different cultures, religions, perspectives, come together in space, you know, it's just what's something that drove me. And now we're going to take that next step. With the Artemis program, which uh, if anyone is aware, that's NASA's effort to put the first woman and the next man on the moon by 2024. Artemis named after the sister of Apollo uh, because of our focus on a more you know, diverse core. Um, we need a new legal framework for that, that there's never been laws to govern this kind of ambitious moving out towards the stars. We have what's called the Intergovernmental Agreement, the IGA, that's the legal framework for the International Space Station. Now we need something new and that's the Artemis Accords. And the idea of the Accords very much echo the Constitution, where we're not being prescriptive. We have principles, right, ideas that we think not only should America live by, but that other countries should to create a safe, peaceful, and transparent future in space. You know, the principles of the Accords, you know, our first peace that begins there, that we want peaceful exploration. NASA is a civil, ex civil space exploration entity. We want others to follow that transparency, that you need to be clear where you are, what you're doing, sharing of scientific data, that when we go forward into space, it should be for all of humanity. And NASA has always publicly released all of its science so that the whole world can come with us on this journey. So what we're going to do with the Artemis program is if you partner with us in Artemis, if you're a country and you're going to work with us, not only are you agreeing to work with us on a piece of hardware, whether that's a lunar rover or a lunar orbiter, but you agree to abide by these principles to create a safe, prosperous future in space. When we go to the moon, we'll not only carry our astronauts, but we'll carry our values forward that will benefit not only America, but everyone in the future. Yeah, yeah, Tovin. Yeah, Tovin and I always uh, look at you know the global picture in any topic that we're talking about, and so I'm glad that you um, that Kathy you know brought up the question and that you answered so grateful. Um, my my other question, follow up to that, is: Have you had any countries that are that are interested? Yeah. So literally across the world, we have received robust interest in the Artemis program and participating in the Artemis Accords. Now, the Artemis Accords are intended to be bilateral agreements for countries that we're going to work with on activities on the moon, or now this is where I really get in trouble, using terms like cislunar space, which just means the space between Earth and the moon. So under the auspices of the Artemis program. Um, I have to be careful because we don't want countries getting jealous of each other, et cetera, or uh, revealing plans. But, you know, we've got both traditional uh, partners such as Canada, Japan, the European Space Agency. They're already working with us on Artemis via Gateway. We're going to continue to leverage the intergovernmental agreement for Gateway. But for any other programs those countries do, you know, we'll do the Artemis Accords with them. What I'm so excited about with the Artemis Accords is with the IGA and the International Space Station, it's very difficult to bring new countries into that. With the Accords, we can engage with a far broader set of international partners, that we have seen a proliferation in the world of interest in space and all of these new space agencies coming into existence from countries like the United Arab Emirates, which and hopefully a month or two, we'll be launching its first interstellar or interplanetary mission. They're going to launch the aptly named HOPE uh, mission to Mars. Australia, 
uh, Luxembourg, South Africa. There's such broader partnerships than we could have ever imagined five, 10, even 20 years ago. And that's what we'll be able to do with the Artemis Accords is broaden out that partnership to take us back to the moon and then ultimately forward to Mars. And Professor O'Keefe, you know, uh, this is this is fascinating. I, I'm the actress, so I'll go to Star Wars, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which I think is one of the best movies on so many levels. Um, as the skeptic here, because I, I know that, I don't know if part of the Artemis Accords is, is you know, whatever you are, like an archeological dig, you own some of that uh, property and who owns what with, you know, and who don't go into my space. Um, so I'm also curious about the archeological digs and, and if the Artemis Accords have something to do with that, who, who owns what. But also, what was the Outer Space Treaty in 1967? I'm curious what that was. Because, you know, I'm, I'm like, I'm a bit of a cynic. You know, China's going to go in and, and want to be the first to the south part of the moon. And we're all going to be fighting for that land and who owns what. So expand on that a little bit, Professor O'Keefe. Well, the original 60s Accords were designed for the purpose of recognizing that there would be um, an increase, an expansion of the number of nation states that were launching various, uh, you know, satellites, assets, whatever else, you know, into space, the United States and Russia being the two dominant ones at that time, the Soviet Union. Uh, but there was also a determination that with this emergence, as, as Mike's talking about, this has been going on for quite a while, where any number of different countries have really stepped up to those opportunities for communications or whatever else. So the original ideas was to deconflict the sheer volume of activity going on up there. Today, it's exponential over that. There is more, you know, activity going on within space of satellites and everything else, whether it's, uh, you know, HBO satellites or whether it's, you know, military intelligence satellites. Either way, that's volume, and there's an awful lot that's going on that's really expanded that. And this is now an even more important time to avoid that kind of challenge of just, you know, rules of the road kind of things in order to, much the same way as we've done, you know, in the United States and across the globe in every nation state on agreements on air traffic control and all those other kind of things. So these become part of that same structure in which it's an imperative for the common good whether it's a national common good or a global one they all share the same thing which is to avoid those kinds of uh, challenges and issues that go forward the other feature i think in the 1960s was that was attempted was to make it a peaceful territory to not militarize the the the, the sphere uh, in a way that would be conducting uh, offensive capabilities of war from space. And the objective was in part to try to begin that dialogue and that negotiation. And it's still ongoing. There's no doubt about that in terms of how far that's going to take us. But at the same time, that's part of the reason why there's always been a severability between NASA as a civil agency and now what was Air Force is now this part of Air Force space force as the military kind of focus on that side of it and it's not that they're they don't talk to each other they, they do a lot but at the same time they have different kinds of responsibilities in civil space versus in, in a military sphere that was really interesting what was said earlier about the fact that the air force was born out of the army because suddenly there were planes i thought that was and now this the the, the Correlation there is, you know, space forces come out of the Air Force. Really, really, really interesting. Uh, well, Toba... fact, it's kind of like the Marine Corps within the Navy. Space Force is now part of the, Air, the Department of the Air Force, whereas the Marine Corps is part of the Department of the Navy. And that's a long historic legacy since the founding of our Republic. But it's in, in the case of Navy Marine Corps. But today, with, with the, the new creation of Space Force, it is part of, it's a carve out, if you will, of units and functions within the Air Force that has a chief of staff of the, Air, of the Air Force and a chief of staff of the Space Force, but still one secretary of the Air Force responsible for the entirety of that department. 
Fascinating. We're learning so much. Y'all are great. Uh, Tova, what's your question? All right. So um, thank you, Janine. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about what kind of like long-term effects this could have on the way that space exploration is conducted, because on one hand, um, the, the introduction of, you know, a lot of private citizens and private companies could add a lot of innovation um, to and, and allow regular people, non-governmental people to be more involved in space exploration. But on the other hand, the CEOs of these companies are a very spe specific subsect of, you know, uh, ultra rich elite, elite people. Um, so I was wondering, do you think that the introduction and implementation of these private companies will democratize space exploration or will it make it more elite? Well, it's definitely going to democratize it a whole lot more. When you look at the backgrounds of two of the most dominant of the, the um, uh, entrepreneurs who have run SpaceX and Blue Origin respectively, both of them came from relatively modest means. I mean, they, these were not people who were born, you know, into some condition in which they uh, uh, inherited well or anything else. Both of them were folks who really made everything that they see now uh, as a consequence of their own ingenuity, who utilized the capacity and the capitalist opportunities that this democracy, this system we embrace where it coexists with that, those democratic principles. They're, they were the beneficiaries of that, but they sure weren't one when they were kids, that's for sure. This was not something they started with. They built that, and as a consequence, those, those are the, the representatives of opportunity that can be a benefit across the board. And there are many, many other players in the space industry and in the space community writ large who certainly are not within that role of, of the of elitism at all. And if anything, uh, their capacity actually to go forward and do these kinds of things is based on their power persuasion, their ability to motivate others to invest in that opportunity. And for all of us as a public to benefit by that. And that's, that's what they're certainly about the process of achieving. And Tova, I think we've already seen that democratization take place, and there was a great example of it in Florida earlier today, that the opportunities that you and Dakari are going to have to participate and be a part of space exploration, space development, is already light years ahead of what my generation and Sean's generation were able to take advantage of. Uh, not that everyone wants to be a space lawyer, but when I was coming out of law school, if you wanted to practice space law, you either went to NASA or maybe a Boeing or a Lockheed. Now, Blue Origin, SpaceX, as well as some of the smaller entrepreneurial companies you don't hear a lot about, but are doing terrific work like NanoRacks and Made in Space, there's just, a, again, a pr great proliferation of all these companies doing incredible things. And what's really exciting is we're at the beginning. Like we haven't even gotten to the end of the beginning in terms of what these entrepreneurial entities are going to lead to and the opportunity that they're going to provide for all of us. It was Doug and Bob, professional astronauts, going up today. But you know what was really exciting about seeing the Dragon go? It's the first time that a spacecraft that will be used by both the government and the private sector has been launched. And while this launch made a great deal to me and to all of us at NASA, we're really looking forward to that first launch that's carried out by private citizens. Now it's not gonna be cheap and it's not gonna be available to everyone right away, but just like air travel, you know, it starts out that it costs a lot and then those costs comes down and more opportunities come up. And I look forward to the day when we're all flying to space like we would on Southwest Airlines. So it's coming and that process has already begun. It is. I love Southwest Airlines. And, you know, Professor O'Keefe, what you said about the fact that, that these, these, you know, elitists, so to speak, that are, are funding these things were actually start, didn't start out that way, that they are self-made due to the opportunities America gave them. It's really, really good information to have. And, you know, it's so different than when the kings and queens funded the colonialization of America. You know, that did come from royalty. Um, but look at the difference. I love this juxtaposition and comparison that with in a democracy of America, it's not a royalty, it's not a king or a queen. It's they've actually worked their way up with ingenuity and power of persuasion. Well, well said. As, uh, so, okay, um, uh, uh, to Kathy, your turn. 
Well, this has just been fascinating. We have a question from a listener, uh, Michael Amowitz, who wants to know, he says, the budget and schedule of plans have always been a concern. Are we on track and do we have adequate private and public funding at this time for the NASA programs we have planned? Definitely yours, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> so, look, we can always use more time and we can always use more funding. Uh, there's no question of that. But what's so exciting to me uh, about the Artemis program is the fact that we can close with existing budgets and we're not looking for miracles. Uh, you know, I, I think it's been terrific, and again, Sean is a good example of this, that political leadership at NASA and people who understand the congressional process and understand the budgetary process. You know, when we were in the space race, one of the reasons we were losing at first was the brilliance of Korolev, who knew how to work the Soviet system to get funds. And uh, NASA's, and, and again, uh, you know, Sean's way up there, but, you know, probably our greatest administrator was Jim Webb. And he has a background much like yours, Sean, right? He was a Hill staffer, you know, attorney, you know, wasn't a professional engineer, but knowing how to work with Congress to get the budget that you need. And that's why it's such a pleasure and honor to work for Jim Bridenstine, who literally comes out of Congress. And that the job of the NASA administrator is to make sure we're on time and have our budget. And I've been thrilled to see the bipartisan agreements that we have. You know, the president gave us a phenomenal budget. It's some of the best that NASA's ever seen in its history. We have the vice president leading the National Space Council. Uh, but also, you know, Nancy Pelosi went and told Jim Bridenstine at Equality Day at NASA Ames, you go and get that first woman on the moon. We've never had bipartisan agreement, bicameral agreement like we've got. And frankly, what's even worse than partisanship is the moon-Mars divide that that had bogged us down at NASA and the space industry as a whole. You think Republicans and Democrats don't like each other? You should see the moon and Mars people in a room. You know, people <laughs> used to say, every dollar we spend on the moon is a dollar we're not spending on Mars. And the Artemis program, by uniting the two and saying that we go to the moon to get to Mars, has brought us together as a nation and will allow us to move forward with a budget that we're getting bipartisan support for. Isn't there actual ice in the south side of the moon, and that's why everyone wants to start a, you know, to uh, colonialize the south side of the moon? Is that correct? Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, we once thought that the moon was bone dry, no water. And when we discovered not only is there water, but tremendous amounts of water ice that can then be turned into oxygen, turned into fuel, uh, or used for drinking and cooling, the moon is a far more active and beneficial environment than we had ever imagined. And that's what we know now. NASA has a program called CLIPS, where we're going to send swarms of robotic systems to explore the moon in anticipation of the landings in 2024. We can't even imagine what more we're going to discover, but what I can guarantee you is it's going to inspire awe, it's going to inspire wonder, and it will enable us to take that next step to Mars in ways that you can't even imagine. So uh, I'm gonna toss it, I think, I think Dakar, uh, Toba's next, or Dakar, I don't know, I'm a little confused, but uh, so the colonialization you think will happen first on the moon, if that's even sort of possible, before we go do that on Mars? Yeah, so uh, people like to say Mars is in my heart, but the moon is in my business plan. That certainly as we, as we look at commercialization, you know, first it's really going to begin in low Earth orbit. That, you know, the International Space Station has been a tremendous activity, not just technologically, but politically. I believe that it deserves a Nobel Peace Prize. And we're going to discover new commercial and industrial applications. Microgravity, which just means there's a lack of gravity, will open up whole new areas for research and development. Um, growing everything from retinas to new knees in space, new substances that can be used for computing and aerospace. I believe that the countries and the companies that can leverage microgravity research and development will be the economic and even national security giants of the future. So that's going to occur in what we call low Earth orbit, or orbiting the Earth now. But as you mentioned, there are rare Earth elements, helium-3, um, there are resources, water ice on the moon, and maybe now you can't quite close those business cases, but there's really interesting opportunities, whether it's harvesting resources, 
solar panels to create energy, and just the scientific explorations that we're going to learn from having telescopes on the far side of the moon and being able to gather that astronomical data, uh, it is going to be a treasure trove for humanity from both the scientific, uh, commercial, uh, and I believe even humanitarian perspective. Oh, that's great. I, I just add in, another in, footnote to that, if I could, Janine, real quick. Is Mike hit around, sure. there's, there's a wide range yeah. of capabilities that come from uh, lunar exploration that we're now discovering the depth of all that. But in addition to all that, one of the other great advantages of operating on the lunar surface, frankly, as opposed to on the Earth's surface, is the gravitational position there is one sixth of that of the, of the Earth. Now, the ability to launch once you configure something from the lunar surface to anywhere else is infinitely easier than it is to launch from here. All that fire and fury you saw today, you know, that took eight and a half minutes to get into a, a, orbit, all of that is expending 90% of all the fuel they're carrying just to get out of the gravitational risk grip of this planet. That won't be the case on the lunar surface. So if you want to go somewhere, that's an easier place to go from. And, the, and it's only you know, 250,000 miles away, as a consequence, that's really close by comparison to anything else we could be dealing with in a much easier environment to work from. Once you set up the, the baseline, the infrastructure, the facility capacity to do that, suddenly you've got a really tremendous opportunity to operate from a place like that. And it's a, it, we're finding more that's of terms of what strategic opportunities are. That's fascinating. I'm sort of jealous because I think the future is going to be so amazing with people going to the moon and the moon to Mars. Okay, your ticket's ready, you know, board the flight. Uh, I don't know that we'll see it in my lifetime. I don't, I don't know where we are. And, um, but also, uh, before I toss it, you raise your hand, whoever wants to go next. Uh, but, but are we the first country to do public and private enterprise, government and private enterprise to get a, are we the first one to utilize private enterprise? First country? Yeah. You know anything else, Mike? I mean, I guess this is the, the principal case where you have a, a services contract where SpaceX owns the asset and they're providing a service to send folks to the, to folks to the International Space Station, like yeah. sending cargo and supplies to the International Space Station. They do that on a service contract. And as a result, that's a, that's a public-private contract, a, a partnership of the highest order. Is everything all about the configuration, what it's got to be performance standards, all those things uh, were collaborated on between those two, NASA and SpaceX, in a way that is really quite a, a, a working business model that can be portable to all kinds of other opportunities. So there are really very, you know, very few other circumstances where you see that level of public-private partnering engagement with a very clear contractual vehicle of rights and responsibilities and everything else that goes along with it that has got terrific clarity. You deliver the, this cargo, and then you get your opportunity to be paid. You don't deliver the cargo, you don't get paid. <laughs> it's, a, it's a straight it's as straightforward as yeah, that. Yeah, truly a, American. Tr truly American. Okay. We'll just Total give one quick I'll just give one quick anecdote there that, sure, sure. you know, it's a real tribute, you know, like Sean says, to the self-made visionaries of people like Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, you know, et cetera. When I went through the launch campaigns in Russia, you know, they would say and complain that their billionaires all just bought yachts. Ours build space companies. And I think ah. that's something that's, truly American that, you know, rather than rest on their laurels or, you know, selfishly invest in, you know, their own enjoyment, that our entrepreneurs go further and have done some amazing things that with partnerships and, and good government leadership that we've been able to take advantage of. I, I do want to say that, you know, while, you know, Sean's correct that, you know, certainly to this agree, there's no one who's ever done partnerships like we do. We innovated the idea of commercial space in America. There was a period where, frankly, Russia was doing it better. Um, and China and Europe, that the commercial launch market had been shipped 
virtually entirely overseas, that you know, US companies prior to SpaceX were just not competing at all. We went from being number one in commercial space to maybe having one launch per year. And it was the public-private partnerships that NASA innovated where we you know, helped create companies like SpaceX for our needs. But what the taxpayer got from it was not just a company that could meet NASA's needs, but ones that can meet the private sector needs. And now the whole world is trying to catch up to American innovation and entrepreneurship that these companies have brought to our shores. And we brought that industry back to America, back to Florida, and it's been extraordinary to see. That's great. That, that's, I'm really glad. That's why this day was so fantastic, yes? Um, okay, we have eight minutes, six minutes left. Can someone raise their hand who wants the burning last question? <laughs> oh no, both of them did. I don't know who got, okay, uh, Dakari, I think you had to step away. Go ahead, Dakari. Um, so my question is, uh, so I'm, I'm always complimenting um, people's fashion. Uh, Janine and Kathy and Jeanette can all, can all account for this. And my question is, I'm looking at what they were wearing today. Much, much different from the pumpkin suits, as I would call them. Um, from from before or back in the day. So, what was what was that inspiration? It's all yours, Mike. I, I have no oh. idea where they came up with it. So, you know, as you saw, from everything from the suits to the Tesla to the reintroduction of the Worm logo uh, that you see on my jacket, it's important for NASA to inspire. And let me say that while we talk about it, and that's an overall good, right? We want to inspire, we want more people in STEM, but beyond that, we need people, we need engineers, we need scientists to actually implement the ambitious programs that I'm talking about. And when we have launches like this, when we launch the space launch system, which is gonna be the largest rocket humanity's ever built, we're gonna face a wave of retirements and the NASA workforce skews older. Uh, I like going to work every day because it makes me feel young sometimes when I, go in and our administrator is often the youngest person in the room. So we need things like suits that look good, cars that are exciting, emblems that inspire to get the youth engaged, to get you, know, you interested in coming on board. And the suits, you know, the presentation that you saw on NASA TV that I think was the best that anyone's ever seen, that's all part of it. So everything from the fashion on down was developed to inspire, and to attract youth to be a part of this grand adventure. And, you know, the pumpkin suits don't necessarily get that job done. So I'm glad to see us move forward with something that's a bit more fashionable and attractive. And then and it may be one of the reasons as, as a marketer that they said Doug and Bob, you know, they want to make Doug and Bob sort of, you know, one of one of the youth, one of the millennials say, hey, they're relatable. Come, come join Doug and Bob. But also, the, what was this? What was this PS, I love you, I still love you? I, what was that? Yeah, so um, Elon is a big fan of science fiction. And that, uh, I think, is from one of his science fiction novels. And I forget quite which uh, series of stories it's from. The Falcon itself uh, is taken, I believe, from Star Wars, from a certain Millennium Falcon you know, you may be familiar with. So science fiction media plays a huge role in, I think, inspiring a lot of us. Well, I know, Janine, you know, you said you're a Star Wars fan. I'm, I'm more of a Star Trek fan. And for <laughs> me, it was terrific, you know, because the Artemis Accords are all about stopping conflict, you know, preventing that international conflict before it happens. And there was a headline and a quote that I gave that the Artemis Accords is about creating a future that's less like Star Wars and more like Star Trek. So, you know, we've all got our, our science fiction series that we love and look to for inspiration. And that's where those names come from that Elon gave. But I mean, was that the part of the ship that returned? That was the barge. What? That's What's the name that? of the barge. That's the name of the barge. So there's the floating barge that oh, the first stage come okay. back and landed on. That's his name for the barge. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just didn't know that. Uh, um, Mr. Uh, uh, Professor O'Keefe, did you want to build on any of that? You no, know, I just want to mention that there was a pragmatic reason, I think, too, for why the spacesuits are different. I mean, the, the original design and configuration was to accomplish pressurization and all those other features. And that was what the technology of that time accommodated. So as a consequence, if they look like pumpkin suits, <laughs> in part is because, 
you know, they're really kind of in a situation where they're trying to pressurize the, the capacity there. We're doing all kinds of different things to work through that. Now, what you see, you know, in the design that was, was, was produced and yielded for this particular uh, set of opportunities, this is a, a, an upgrade over uh, what it has been in part in order to improve the capability and the performance of that suit to provide pressurization inside uh, the spaceship, the capsule itself. And once it gets out of uh, the atmospheric condition and they lose, you know, all the, the other features that go along with that, there's got to be something that's going to compensate for that. And those suits better work. That's part of the reason why they're, they're an improved design, improved configuration, designed more for the physique now and more, you know, functional than what it was before. But previously, that was as far as the technology was going to take. <laughs> so there was a that, that, practical reason for that, too. In addition to the, Ralph the fashion. It was, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the Ralph Lauren. It was the Ralph Lauren, you know, uh, uh, Olympic um, design. Tova, give the last quick question, Tova. Um, sure. So I was wondering how the values of the Constitution influence the work that NASA does and the values that NASA tries to project and how that differs from countries that maybe don't share a similar constitution to us and don't share the same values as America outside of the scientific arena, how does that influence the scientific um, collaboration and exploration? It's a great point. Yeah, it's a, a great question. And while NASA's primary mission is scientific discovery, scientific exploration, you know, taking our values into the solar system and beyond is a big part of it. You know, you heard the president say that, you know, if you're number two in space, you're not going to be number one on earth. And it's very important for the protection of the freedoms and liberties that we enjoy as Americans, that we do succeed in space, particularly economically. And if you look at what we're trying to do with the Artemis Accords, we're pushing forward constitutional and American values of transparency, of sharing science, of deconflicting activities to prevent uh, harm and conflict, the rule of law. Now, not every country shares that. And China was mentioned before, and it's unfortunate that we've seen almost two divergent concepts develop in space law and exploration. One is opaque and you know unknown. You don't see a lot of what happens. One doesn't respect a lot in terms of hurting people that we had a Chinese rocket with debris that could have hit Los Angeles or New York had it re-entered a little bit earlier, and then there were reports of debris showing up in Africa. That's not the way to run a space program. And the best way that we can combat that is to embrace what makes us great as Americans, which is our values, our transparency, and our sharing of scientific data with the entire world. We may not be able to force China and other countries to act like that, but by leading by example, we can show the world the way to a peaceful future. Beautifully said. Yeah, we just want to thank y'all again so much for being with us tonight. It was fascinating and it was such an honor to have to have you, Professor O'Keefe, with your leadership for so many years with NASA and and Mike with your leadership currently with NASA with to have such a big day and then be able to join us. It means a lot to us and, and all the people that were able to join our program tonight. As as an actress, you know, you have the actor that's in front of the camera, I guess like Doug and Bob, uh, but movies don't just happen poof. I mean, it's like, a, it's like a canvas and everyone has to put their art. You have to have the script and you have to have the, the director and the sound editors and the editors and the producers, and the executive producers, and everyone comes together to put the painting and the bring the movie, the television show to life. So I personally want to thank the two of you, Mr. Mr. Gold and Professor O'Keefe, for the great contribution with your brilliance and you are heroes as far as I'm concerned for your dedication to, to space and to space exploration. And the two of you have helped bring this beautiful day together. And so I want to applaud the two of you. It's a, it's a team effort. And again, there's a lot of people who came before us and you know, thank you so much for this night and Dakari and Tova and all the students who are listening, your time is coming. We're doing this for you. Thank you all very much. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thanks for listening tonight.